now it's time for chapter four of Treasure Island, The Sea Chest. And where we left off at the end of uh, the last chapter, our friend and the captain, Billy Bones, had dropped dead. He had a terrible shock and he hadn't been taking very good care of himself. And unfortunately, our narrator, Jim, was really upset by this because his father had just died and now another death right there in front of him after being treated so badly by the blind beggar had showed up. So now chapter four is called The Sea Chest. So if you remember what the sea chest was, it was at the very uh, beginning when the captain arrived in a wheelbarrow. He had a guy um, following him with this big chest, a sea chest. So when you imagine like the pirate's treasure chest kind of chest, imagine that, like one of those big kind of rounded top ones with the metal and wood and all that. So he has a sea chest and there's a chapter about it. So that tells you that maybe it's important. Okay, so here we go. Make sure that you have your notes page with you so that you can um, write down some things as we go. Or here's a really great idea. Use a pencil to underline or circle things in the text as you read it, or use a highlighter. Okay, you can write in the margins, write all over the text. That's why I gave you this so that you can um, mark on it because that'll help you find things that you need to know for later. Lost no time, of course, in telling my mother all that I knew, and perhaps I should have told her long before, and we saw ourselves at once in a difficult and dangerous position. Some of the man's money, if he had any, was certainly due to us, but it was not likely that our captain's shipmates, above all the two specimens seen by me, Black Dog and the Blind Beggar, would be inclined to give up their booty in payment of the dead man's debts. The captain's order to mount at once and ride for Dr. Livesey would have left my mother alone and unprotected, which was not to be thought of. Indeed, it seemed impossible for either of us to remain much longer in the house. The fall of the coals in the kitchen grate, the very ticking of the clock, filled us with alarms. The neighborhood to our ears seemed haunted by approaching footsteps, and what between the dead body of the captain on the parlor floor and the thought of that detestable blind beggar hovering near at hand and ready to return, there were moments when, as the saying goes, I jumped in my skin for terror. Something must speedily be resolved upon, and it occurred to us at last to go forth together and seek help in the neighboring hamlet. No sooner said than done, bareheaded as we were, we ran out at once in the gathering evening in the frosty fog. So he tells his mom about what the captain had told him before about he had stuff that they were coming to get. And they're like, oh, dang, he owes us money. We, we should get his money, but then these guys are coming back. So let's go get help from the town, okay? The hamlet, the town, uh, lay not many hundred yards away, though out of view on the other side of the next cove. And what greatly encouraged me, it was in an opposite direction from that whence the blind man had made his appearance and whither he had presumably returned. We were not many minutes on the road, though we sometimes stopped to lay hold of each other and hearken, but there was no unusual sound, nothing but the low wash of the ripple and the croaking of the inmates of the wood. So the inmates, that just means that they could hear frogs in the woods, they could hear the ripple of the water, you know, so they were listening, they were concerned, but they didn't hear anything different. It was already candlelight when we reached the hamlet, and I shall never forget how much I was cheered to see the yellow shine in doors and windows. But that, as it proved, was the best of the help we were likely to get in that quarter. For, you would have thought men would have been ashamed of themselves, no soul would consent to return with us to the Admiral Benbow. The more we told of our troubles, the more, man, woman, and child, they clung to the shelter of their houses. The name of Captain Flint, though it was strange to me, was well enough known to some there and carried a great weight of terror. Some of the men who had been to field work on the far side of the Admiral Bembo remembered, besides, to have seen several strangers on the road and taking them to be smugglers to have bolted away. And one at least had seen a little lugger, and that's a boat, a type of boat in what we called Kit's Hole, which is like a little cove nearby, right? For that matter, anyone who was a comrade of the captain's was enough to frighten them to death. And the short and the long of the matter was that while we could get several who were willing enough to ride to Dr. Livesey's, which lay in another direction, not one would help us defend the inn. They went to get help and nobody's gonna help them, okay? 
They say cowardice is infectious, but then argument is, on the other hand, a great emboldener. And so when each had had his say, my mother made them a speech. She would not, she declared, lose money that belonged to her fatherless boy. If none of the rest of you dare, she said, Jim and I dare, back we will go the way we came. And small things to you big hulking chicken hearted men, we'll have that chest open if we die for it. And I'll thank you for that bag, Mrs. Crossley, to bring back our lawful money in it. Of course I said I would go with my mother, and of course they all cried out at our foolhardiness. But even then, not a man would go along with us. All they would do is to give me a loaded pistol lest we were attacked, and to promise to have horses ready saddled in case we were pursued on our return, while one lad was to ride forward to the doctors in search of armed assistance. So they give him a loaded pistol, they say they'll send for help, but they're not going to go back to the inn with him because they're afraid of Captain Flint's men. Captain Flint apparently is a very scary pirate name to these people. My heart was beating finally when we, two, when we two set forth in the cold night upon this dangerous venture. A full moon was beginning to rise and peered redly through the upper edges of the fog, and this increased our haste, for it was plain before we came forth again that all would be as bright as day, and our departure exposed to the eyes of any watchers. We slipped along the hedges, noiseless and swift, nor did we see or hear anything to increase our terrors, till, to our relief, the door of the Admiral Bembo had closed behind us. We go back home. Okay. I slipped the bolt at once, locked the door, okay? And we stood and panted for a moment in the dark, alone in the house with the dead captain's body. Then my mother got a candle at the bar, in the bar and holding each other's hands, we advanced into the parlor. He lay as we had left him on his back with his eyes open and one arm stretched out. Draw down the blind, Jim, whispered my mother. They might come and watch outside. And now, she said when I had done so, we have to get the key off that. And who's to touch it, I should like to know. She gave a kind of sob as she said the words. I went down on my knees at once. On the floor close to his hand, there was a little round of paper, blackened on the one side. I could not doubt that this was the black spot. And taking it up, I found written on the other side, in a very good, clear hand, this short message. You have till 10 tonight. He had till 10, mother, said I. And just as I said it, our old clock began striking. The sudden noise startled us shockingly, but the news was good, for it was only six. Now, Jim, she said, that key. I felt in his pockets, one after another. A few small coins, a thimble, and some thread, and big needles, a piece of pigtail tobacco bitten away at the end, his gully, which is a type of knife, with a crooked handle, a pocket compass, and a tinder box were all that they contained, and I began to despair. Perhaps it's round his neck, suggested my mother. Overcoming a strong repugnance, I tore open his shirt at the neck, and there, sure enough, hanging to a bit of tarry string, which I cut with his own gully, we found the key. At this triumph, we were filled with hope and hurried upstairs without delay to the little room where he had slept so long and where his box had stood since the day of his arrival. I want you to imagine that scene. Poor, uh... Jim is just a kid. He's a young kid, maybe 12, 13 years old. And they come back to get this money that his mom is insisting on doing without anybody there to help protect them. Just her young boy and his loaded pistol that he borrowed. Okay. And there's a dead body and she's like, oh, I'm just going to touch it. Oh. Jim goes down and searches the dead body. It's not in his pockets. And so she's like, oh, Maybe it's around his neck. Still, she's all not going to touch him. She makes her little boy do it. <laughs> this is a rough scene. Poor Jim. Or, well, or wow for Jim. He's really tough for a kid, right? It was like any other... Okay, let's see. Sorry. Let me pick up where we were. Uh, so they find is the box that he, that he left, right? It was like any other seaman's chest on the outside. The initial B burned on the top of it with a hot iron, and the corners somewhat smashed and broken as by long, rough usage. Give me the key, said my mother, and though the lock was very stiff, she had, it turned it, she had turned it and thrown back the lid in a twinkling. A strong smell of tobacco and tar rose from the interior, but nothing was to be seen on the top except a suit of very good clothes, carefully brushed and folded. They had never been worn, my mother said. 
under that, the miscellany began. A quadrant, which is a tool you use for navigating ships, a tin canican, this can, several sticks of tobacco. So instead of having like tobacco in a cigarette or um, even um, like people used to chew tobacco, it would be like um, the dried wrapped leaves almost, it would almost look like a pepperoni stick of tobacco and they would chew it off, right? And then they put it in the pipe to smoke it. They talk about pipe smoking all the time in this story, in, in this story because that was the, the way that they smoked tobacco was in a pipe, um, not with cigarettes. So when they're talking about pipes, that's what they're doing, okay? Um, there are two brace of handsome pistols. A brace is, um, is a pair of, so there are two pairs of them. A piece of bar silver, an old Spanish watch, and some other trinkets of little value and mostly of foreign make. A pair of compasses mounted with brass and five or six curious West Indian shells. I have often wondered since why he would have, he should have carried about these shells with him in his wandering, guilty, and hunted life. In the meantime, we had found nothing of any value but the silver and the trinkets, and neither of these were in our way. Underneath there were, was an old boat cloak, whitened with sea salt on many a harbor bar. My mother pulled it up with impatience, and there lay before us the last things in the chest, a bundle tied up in oilcloth and looking like papers, and a canvas bag that gave forth at a touch the jingle of gold. So two things left, a little bundle covered in oilcloth and a canvas bag that jingled of coins. Oil cloth is a canvassy cloth that is infused with a lot of oil so that it repels water. And so sailors would have used it to protect things like papers and other things they didn't want to get wet. You can still see that kind of cloth. Uh, if somebody has like what they call an outback coat, you know, it's kind of a dark, dark brown or almost black um, canvas that's oily and it's really great if you're out hunting or something because the, the water comes off of it really well. So that's what this packet was made for, okay? Um, I'll show these rogues that I'm an honest woman, said my mother. I'll have my dues and not a farthing over. Hold Mrs. Crossley's bag. And she began to count over the amount of the captain's score from the sailor's bag into the one that I was holding. It was a long, difficult business, for the coins were of all countries and sizes, doubloons, louis doors, and guineas, and pieces of eight. And I know not what besides, all shaken together at random. The guineas, too, were about the scarcest, and it was with these only that my mother knew how to make her count. There's a bunch of different kinds of coins from all over the place, from all over the world, but they're only looking for the ones that the mother can recognize and count because she wants to get an accurate count of how much money they robbed. Okay. When we were about halfway through, I suddenly put my hand upon her arm, for I had heard in the silent, frosty air a sound that brought my heart into my mouth, the tap tapping of the blind man's stick upon the frozen road. It drew nearer and nearer while we sat holding our breath. Then it struck sharp on the end door, and then we could hear the handle being turned and the bolt rattling as the wretched being tried to enter. And then there was a long time of silence both within and without. At last, the tapping recommenced, and to our indescribable joy and gratitude, died slowly away again until it ceased to be heard. Mother, said I, take the hole and let's be going for I was sure the bolted door must have seemed suspicious and would bring the whole hornet's nest about our ears. Though how thankful I was that I had bolted it, none could tell who had never met that terrible blind man. But my mother, frightened as she was, would not consent to take a fraction more than was due to her and was obstinately unwilling to be content with less. It was not yet seven, she said, by a long way. She knew her rights and she would have, and she would have them. And she was still arguing with me when a little low whistle sounded a good way off upon the hill. That was enough and more than enough for both of us. I'll have what I have, she said, jumping to her, into, to her feet. And I'll take this to square the count, said I, picking up the oilskin packet. Next moment, we were both groping downstairs, leaving the candle by the empty chest. And the next we had opened the door and were in full retreat. We had not started a moment too soon. The fog was rapidly dispersing. Already the moon shone quite clear on the high ground on either side, and it was only in the exact bottom of the dell and round the tavern door that a thin veil still hung unbroken to conceal the first steps of our escape. Far less than halfway to the hamlet, very little beyond the bottom of the hill, we must come forth into the moonlight. 
Nor was this all, for the sound of several footsteps running came already to our ears, and as we looked back in their direction, a light tossing to and fro and still rapidly advancing showed that one of the newcomers carried a lantern. My dear, said my mother suddenly, take the money and run on. I'm going to faint. Seriously. She made him... She made him rummage through the dead body stuff. She made them stay late so she could count an accurate count. And now she's going to faint. Okay, here we go. This was certainly the end for both of us, I thought. How I cursed the cowardice of the neighbors. How I blamed my poor mother for her honesty and her greed, for her past foolhardiness and present weakness. We were just at the little bridge by good fortune, and I helped her, tottering as she was, to the edge of the bank, where, sure enough, she gave a sigh and fell on my shoulder. I do not know how I found the strength to do it at all, and I am afraid it was roughly done, but I managed to drag her down the bank in a little way under the arch. Farther I could not move her, for the bridge was too low to let me do more than crawl below it. So there we had to stay, my mother almost entirely exposed and both of us with an earshot of the inn. So they get to the little bridge on the way to the little town nearby and she faints on him and he like crawls under the bridge and pulls her part way with him. But even though it's nighttime, it's a very brightly lit moonlit night and it's not a good hiding place. So I guess we'll see what happens in the next chapter. Meanwhile, Make sure that you fill out those notes. Summarize the action of the story. Okay. They go to get help. They can't get any. They come back. They go through his stuff. They go in through the chest. Maybe look at the contents of the chest. Maybe that's important. And then what happens at the end? And then you're going to make predictions. This is one of those that is kind of fun to make predictions for. You know that those other pirate types are coming back. So what's going to happen next? Right? Write that down. What's the author trying to accomplish with this kind of information that he's giving out right now? What's, or, or what are we supposed to know? What are we learning about the character of Jim? What kind of kid is he, right? Okay, what did you wonder about? What did you like? What was hard? Write something down for each of those things. Then on the back, make sure you write about the characters, write about Jim, write about his mom. There's this third space, and I guess you have a couple choices there. Maybe you could write something about the townspeople. That might not be so bad. And don't forget to write some of the most difficult and challenging vocabulary. Make sure you look up the definitions for it. Use your phone. Use a regular dictionary. Um, and then finally, draw a picture. What's the most inter interesting thing to draw now? Is it them counting? I've had students in the past who made like a picture of all the stuff that they that were, were listed in the chest. That was interesting. Um, Maybe the hiding under the bridge, the mom fainting. Any of those things could be a picture and it would help you understand and remember what happened in the chapter. Okay, so that's it for this chapter. Join me again for the next.